Sunday morning. It was recorded, but I was terrible. I was the one they always caught in the choir swaying with the music. Okay, and, it, and my pastor would watch a video and he'd say, you need to stand still. But I can't help it, pastor. I'm just like, you know, I'm just having a good time. And when I would do the offering, when I was called to be the head usher and I had to look all prim and proper, I was up there and I would always, and he said, you need to keep a straight face. And there would be this lady in the front row that would just sit there, and this older lady in her 70s or 80s, she purposely would make faces at me to make me laugh. And I just, I love that lady. She was so, she made my day. And I just, I'd blame it on her. I'd say, Pastor, this lady made me laugh. You know, and I, you know, we need to have a good time in the Lord. People can't, don't think that we're a bunch of fuddy-duddies. So, if, there, if do people really use that word anymore, I don't, do they, Sam? I don't know. Okay. Do you know what a fuddy-duddy is? Anyway, let's continue on. Welcome, everybody, to Elisha's Home and Ministries. And uh, just remind you that our, our service starts, our Facebook time, Facebook live service usually starts about this time, around 1045 on Sunday morning. Our church service with our worship is uh, usually starts at 10. On Tuesday nights, I have a service at 7 on Facebook live. Peggy does Wednesday nights at 7. And Friday, Pastor Tim and I um, share back and forth at 7 o'clock uh, for Facebook live. And then Sunday morning, again, we rotate. So you just never know who you're going to get. And that's, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, the, last, the last few weeks I've been talking about seed time and harvest. I hope you're not bored. Hannah, are you bored yet? No. Okay, good. Okay. I, uh, I warn people when I do weddings and funerals, I do a lot of things off the cuff. If you don't like that, don't hire me. Just, just I warn them ahead of time. You know, if, 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 I, if I get a squirrel moment, you know, like on that movie Up, like, oh, squirrel, you know, or I, I'll do it. I, I, and I hopefully, God doesn't mind. Lord, forgive me if you do. But I've, I've been talking about seed time and harvest. And it's been a real, I'll be honest with you, the more I dig into the word, the more I study a specific subject, the, the more excited I get. Now, see, you should be the same way. You, and people say, well, you're a preacher. It doesn't matter. The key is, when God gives you a revelation about something, revealed, not, uh, revealed word of God, um, the knowledge of God is revealed in your spirit, in your heart, then you need to grab a hold of that and run with it. And I don't mean make your own theology. I mean you need to study it so that you have a strong foundation. And what was great about doing this the uh, seed time and harvest sermon, again, I've done it over the years. You have to remember, I've been preaching over 28 years. And so some sermons get duplicated in one way or another. They're never the same. And people say, well, what do you mean? There's been times, years ago, I substituted uh, some of the local Methodist churches that had two or three charges. And you had to preach the same sermon. And the wife of the, one of the pastors, in fact, the pastor Hinckley, uh, he is, he's had so many different churches and powerful man of God. She warned me, she said, don't worry about it. Every church sermon, it's going to be different. If the Holy Spirit is leading you, it's going to be different. So, so no sweat. So I, I really appreciated that when she told me that. And so I would go from the one Methodist church, and then I'd get in my truck or my car, and I'd fly down to the next one. God forgave me for the speed I had to do. And I would, you know, I'd preach at that one, and it, it was great. And, and the more, you know what, the more you hear the word, what? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. So the more you hear it, the more you speak it, and preachers have a, have a blessing. Because the more we have to say it, the more we grow, the stronger we get. A lot of you, you might hear the one word one time, like in your devotional. Those of you that have your devotional, don't just read it in the morning. Write something down and look at it all day. Take a look at it, and it's, I, I would say it's, well, it's not a good representation, but those people in the past that used to chew, and they put the tobacco in their lip, and they're constantly chewing on that. Well, kind of like, do that with the word. You're chewing on that. You're always getting a little bit of flavor, and, I, and don't send me any nasty letters about a bad story. That's, just, that's an example that a lot of people can relate to. Because you're constantly chewing on it. If you, I love watching cows. Now, you, you think I'm nuts, but I'll tell you, where we live, we actually we moved our electric fence up closer to the road, 
And I can sit in my golf cart and I can watch our, our cattle. We have bulls, steers, cows, and so on. And I can watch them eat grass. And they'll sit there and they'll, they'll get a, a chunk of grass in their mouth. And they'll look at you as they're chewing their cud, as they call it. And you'll just see and they're chewing it back and forth. And all of a sudden their, no, their, uh, their tongue comes out and they swipe their nose a couple of times and they chew their cud. And then all of a sudden you, you kind of see a little bit of a burp and you see that, that went down, came back up. And they're looking at you like, what are you staring at? But see, there's so much to that. We need to chew on God's word that way. We need to, the more we chew on it, the more actually nutrients, if you want to call it, we're going to get from that like a cow does when she chews her cud. And it's so important for us to remember that. So the, the sermons that I've been doing the last two or three weeks, have been, they've been great for me. I don't know about you, but they've been great for me. They've, uh, they've awakened my quieting, my faith that has been quieted over the last six months. Because of all the, the challenges with the, the virus and everything, and trying to be just, trying to be all that you can be for everybody, it, it's been taxing and it's challenged my faith a little bit. And it, like I said, it, it, woke, it awoke my faith. And at times over the years, when, when you're continually attacked as a pastor or in, in ministry, or let's say you're a boss, you know, you're a supervisor, you get to a point that you get tired of people attacking your integrity, your personal uh, feelings, your family, everybody around you. Well, like the Bible says, remember, it isn't the person, it, it is the devil attacking you. Remember, the battle is the Lord's. You know, when you pray for people, you don't pray against the person. You pray against what's influencing that person. But often it's easy to forget when you're just under so much pressure. And you know what? This whole country, I'm just going to say our country, even though it's the world, the whole country over the last six months have been under massive pressure not to do something that would cause somebody else to get hurt. Let alone on the left side over here, we see people rioting, hurting people, hurting other people. And if you tell me that that doesn't affect you and bother you, there's something wrong with you. Because you know that that's not right. Or you hear of this person, something bad going on, and pretty soon all you hear about it in the news is the negative. It's time that we, we start listening to some positive stuff. Start listening to the stories. It's kind of positive, for example, about the man in the, uh, the truck that accidentally ran into the back of a school bus. I think it was um, Friday. And uh, 10 kids were trapped or something like that. And the man in the, the truck who did this, he ran into the back of it. And they got most of the kids out, but there were a bunch of kids trapped. So he jumped out of his truck. He helped to get all these kids out of the bus. The man who actually caused the accident, he helped all these kids get out of the bus. And then he collapsed. He was mortally hurt, but he was more concerned about those kids. When they got into the hospital, he'd passed. Now, that's not a good story, but it's a positive story about humanity. We're not a bunch of evil people trying to hurt everybody. As a whole, God wants us to be more like Christ. There are many thousands and millions of people that aren't acting like Christ. I know that. But God's desire is that we love each other, love your neighbor as yourself, and so on. So praise the Lord for his living word. And the circumstances God allows us to grow and to mature in. See, I'm not even, you all looking, I'm not even halfway through the first page of my sermon. I have 17 pages. And everybody on, at home are going, oh my gosh, how long is this one going to be? God always, God has learned to shorten my sermons. It's, it's great. So anyway, his living word. And how he can help us to grow in whatever circumstance we're in. What ever circumstance. I've been quoting from Galatians chapter 6 for the last few weeks. Tonight, today I want to quote from Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. So if you have your Bibles, go to Galatians 6 verse 9. I believe God can help us to grow in every circumstance, no matter how tough it is. In fact, that's how we grow in character. Galatians 6, starting in verse 9 in the Amplified Bible. And this goes right along with what I said. You know, the more I preach it, the more I speak it, the, the stronger I get, the better I feel. Well, Galatians 6, 9 in the Amplified. Let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good. 
For at that proper time, or at the proper time, we will reap if we do not give in. We will reap if we do not give in. The Passion Bible in verse 9 says, Don't allow yourselves to be weary or disheartened in planting good seeds. For the season of reaping, the wonderful harvest you planted is coming. But see, a lot of us will say, but I, how, you know, I've been waiting for a healing. I've been waiting for my finances to come in. I have been waiting for this relationship to heal. I've been waiting for so long. But the Bible has a promise and God cannot lie. I shared with many of you before that many, many years ago, oh, probably almost 25 years ago, the Lord healed my relationship with one, my one sister who was, I believe, four years, five years older than me. And it was, it was wonderful. He healed it, and we, we spent another 10 or 15 years just working on our relationship, uh, a distance relationship, but we'd see each other every once in a while, and she suddenly died at the age of 53. And, but I tell you what, I praise the Lord. I know she knew the Lord, and I knew that she had rededicated her life to Christ. I knew the pain and agony that she had felt through, because see, churches hurt each other. And she had gone to a church that she had been heard at many, many years before we ever talked. And she had all these questions to ask me, and she actually was blessed to ask me because I could give it from the pastor's point of view. See, not very often that happens. And she said, well, this happened and this happened. And I said, well, have you ever looked at it from, from the person you were attacking, the person that, and she said, I never looked at it that way. And, and little by little, God healed her. In that, and her and her husband started going to an awesome church in San Antonio where she was at. She loved it. And God just really blessed her. And, and honestly, I got to do her funeral in Washington State, her memorial service, and it was a blessing. Yet we all cried like babies. But I was so blessed to know that she knew the Lord, had rededicated her life to Christ, and that one day when I go up to be in heaven, she's going to be one of the people that, that greet me. I'm excited about that. And so we, we need to realize that any circumstance, some, God can use it to change us and to grow us up. And we can reap, I love my voice, we can reap the positive things from those circumstances if we allow God to do that. Many have rightly complained about being quarantined lately, but what have you done about it? What have you done during the quarantine? Some of us are blessed to live on a farm where we still can drive around and talk to the cows and so on. We can build things and do stuff. Other people are stuck in the cities. I don't know how you do it, but you can do it. You still have the word. You still have electricity. If you still have food, you know, you still have the ability to do something. What are you doing about it? So the Lord reminded me yesterday at an internment that I did, that I officiated at, about how we need to focus on the finish line. Not the bumps and the mountains and the straightaways and even the flat tires on the road to where we're going. And people say, how do, you, how do you do that? And you need to know, I preach on things that God deals with me at that moment, at that day, at that week, at that month. So I was, I was called probably the middle, I want to say the middle of this last week from a young person and he just said, he goes, my dad passed away suddenly, and I just wondered if you could do the service. And I started chewing on that. And you're saying, what do you, what do you mean? I said, because every time you do something for the Lord, you want to glorify him. Well, the last time I did anything for this family was 17 years ago. 17, hard to believe it. I mean, we've been up here 24 years. It's been 17 years the last time I saw this man. And so, like I said, I was at this internment, and I started focusing on, started thinking, wow, you know, this is really has me thinking about eternity. And so today's sermon is receiving the final harvest. Receiving the final, you know, I've talked about how God will bless you in the harvest. He'll bless you, you know, while you're here on earth, God's going to continue to bless you. But you know, the final and the best blessing, what is it? It's eternal life, because Christ is our Lord and our Savior. Yes, eternity is our final reward and our final harvest. I am a true believer in receiving a harvest here on earth for the thousands and even millions of seeds we've planted over a lifetime. Do you realize you've planted that many seeds? But there is that final harvest. 
Peg would call it the final chapter or the end of the chapter of one's book. She always asked me, she would, she would say, well, so what do you think that person's final chapter in their book would read? And sometimes it's not a good thing, is it? You look back at some of these people and they've lived a life of hell. And they, think, they thought that they could run with the devil and all of a sudden they die. Well, I pray that they had a moment or two to repent. Otherwise, they'll still be running with the devil. And that's sad. But I like that. The end of the chapter. What is, what is the end of your chapter in your book going to read? We see our ultimate reward in Psalm 84. If you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 84. Psalm 84, verse 10. I love this. So as we're thinking about eternity, and like I said, I'm doing an internment. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that. But it, it was just, it was so powerful when I had a chance to to actually talk to the family members and be there. You know, it, to me, it's an honor and a blessing to be with people that when a baby is born or when somebody is being uh, baptized. I love baptism. I don't mean baby baptisms. I mean a regular baptism. It's such an honor. It's such a blessing to be there to do that. I love doing weddings, and I also love doing funerals. I'd rather do more weddings and baptisms, but whatever God calls me to do. So if you look at... Um, Psalm 84, starting in verse 10, says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Verse 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk blameless. I think the King James actually says, who those who walk uprightly. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. That was verse 12. The Passion Bible says, For just one day of intimacy, now listen to this, with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand at the threshold in front of the gate beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God, than to live my life without you in the most beautiful palace of the wicked. For the Lord God is brighter than the brilliance of the sunrise, wrapping himself around me like a shield. He is so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. Those who walk along his paths with integrity will never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all. O Lord of heaven. Oh, I love this. O Lord of heaven's armies, what euphoria fills those who forever trust in you. That is a powerful, the passion really grabs a hold of it because he's talking about the intimacy that we need to have with God. Our greatest desire about eternity should be that we are going to one day be with God the Father, with Jesus, and all those who went before us who gave their lives to Christ. So at that internment, it was of a local gentleman who had served his community for over 40 years. The description of the man was like that of the fruit of the Spirit. We hear in Galatians, and you don't have to go there, but it's in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of his presence within us, is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we are waiting, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So I just, I thought about this, and I mean, the family told me this is what this man was like. I mean, as a man, some, some people say, well, that was not very manly. You know what? <laughs> you can still have all those fruits and not be fe uh, have a feminist kind of feel about you. You can still be masculine. That's what I'm saying. You can have the fruits of the Spirit and still be masculine. You don't have to sit there and always act so macho about everything. And, and this, so this man had over the years, had acted like that. He was um, a volunteer fireman for the Choconut uh, Fire Company for 30-some years, and just, he'd been a supervisor for 39 years, and I made a joke about that. I said, to have the fruit of the Spirit and be a, a township supervisor around here, I'll tell you what, and not get angry, I'm impressed. And they said that. They said he really didn't get angry, and he didn't get even. Because you've got to watch those little guys who don't get angry, but suddenly they get even. I was that little guy in school. If I didn't get angry, you better you had to worry about it because I was I was stewing. 
And when that stew would finally boil over, man, I, I was a bad person to be around. But this guy had all the fruits of the Spirit. As we finished the service, I thought how short our time on this earth is and how easily we've, we've sown bad seeds into our lives and other people's lives, acting like it's not a big deal. But it's a huge deal when we sow bad seeds. We might think that we're doing the right thing. We might say, well, I'm doing this. And I, sometimes, you know what, it's none of your business. Sometimes, you know, the person that's walking on the wrong side of the road, you can say, hey, do you need something? No, I'm fine. And it's really none of your business. You know, there, but there are times it is your business. But you have to be careful that you don't sow bad seeds into people's lives. I think most people would agree, and I, I, I looked this up, you only live once is simply the, you know, you always hear people, well, you only live once. And usually that talks about people, you know, party hardy, live your life to the fullest, and right before you die, you know, ask God to forgive you. I don't mean that. It's simply, and I heard somebody say this, uh, you only live once is simply the most soul-stirring, hair-raising, heart-warming, mood-lifting, eye-opening four words ever uttered in the history of quotes. You only live once. Now think about that. It's not only a catchy and easily memorial, but it's also in your face, and it's very obvious. A lot of famous and successful people have their own variation of that quote, because really, it's just that good. Perhaps the most enchanting vi version, and I thought this was interesting, because I can't say that I enjoyed listening to this person speak, but this is what he said. You might have heard of his version by Steve Jobs, in his, in his um, commencement that he did at Stanford University in 2005, he said that whatever he's losing sight of, what he values most in life, he would ask himself if he do what he does that day, knowing he would die the next. So again, he, he said whenever he's losing sight of what he values most in life, he asks himself if he'd do what he does that day knowing he would die the next. Well, he came, he was actually sick when he said that. He was actually diagnosed in 2003 with a pancreatic, hope I say this, neuroendocrine tumor in 2003, and he gave that in 2005. He died of respiratory arrest related to that tumor at the age of 56, October the 5th, 2011. Did he know the Lord? I have no idea. Some say he followed the Buddhist religion. Others say he was baptized and raised in the Lutheran church. Only God knows the heart of that man. But he did say something that made a lot of sense. When you lose sight of what values most in life, ask yourself, if I would do that today, knowing I would die the next, would I be doing that? Now you think about that for a moment. I know it's a heavy subject, but it's an important one. Reflecting on all that happened yesterday, I saw flashbacks of 17 years before when I met the man that I now was officiating his home going. I know that sounds weird, but I was, I was officiating his son's wedding at the same place, the same church, the same grounds that I now had to help his family grieve. He was in the cemetery at the wedding we were in the church. It was a church that was built in 1865. Had no windows, just shutters. No lights, and it was dark the day we did the wedding, but thank God for cameras. And it was one of the most beautiful weddings I've ever had. It didn't storm until we were all leaving. And then the heavens opened up. But I remember that church. I remember the steps. I remember so much of that. So here, now I'm doing his father's funeral. It, it, was a, it was a tearjerker, it really was. When 17 years before, we all laughed and we were filled with joy of what was to come for this young couple. In 17 years, they had raised one son that would join the Marines and birthed another that was only 13. And smart as a whip, he was there helping us film the actual funeral, the 13-year-old, so that the brother could see it in the Marines. 
You know, we'd send the video to him because he couldn't be here. They would buy their first house and have a successful business. Now to bury the man who they said set the example in their lives to be great parents, loving couples, a strong community member. In this world, they're, I love this. In this world, they were saying they were the result of what that man had planted in their lives so many years before. So I got to see seed planted 17 years later, seeing, seeing the, the harvest growing up and things starting to be harvested. It was beautiful. And I, I talked to them about, well, how was your marriage? How was everything going? And they say, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Our father and our mother have set the example for us. And more and more of us, we need to do that, even when times get rough. Now, to bury the man, they said, set that example. That, that's just hard. At, at the burial service, at our own burial service, will someone say that about you and I? I was blessed to remind them that there was still more to come, that there was eternity ahead. And they were, willing to, were they willing to give their lives to Christ and to start a new chapter in their lives here on this earth? That's something to really think about. So when I talk about, you know, the, the final uh, harvest, eternity, I'm not joking around. The man's daughter asked to read one of their favorite poems. Most have heard this, but he sure gave us, hmm, the girl sure gave a stronger meaning than ever before because she was reading it from her heart. And I love this. I, in fact, it's interesting, they'd asked me if I could read it, and I, I couldn't read my handwriting in my notes, so I didn't write it down, so I didn't put it in my service. And they said, well, will you do this? And I said, well, I don't have it. Thank God for iPhones. She pulled it up, and this young girl read this. When I say young, she was in her mid-20s. I shouldn't say that's real young, but that's, that's how it is. So it's interesting because Pastor Tim actually preached a message on this. I remember when he preached it. So as the young lady read the poem, I looked out among the gravestones that were, an, were as new as just a few months ago, all the way back to pre-Civil War. There were people that had died and were buried there. The, the tombstones were old. There were some very old tombstones. And most of them had a dash between birth and death. And you know what I'm going to read. How do you live your dash? Remember that one? Some of you remember Pastor Tim's sermon? The phrase, live your dash, comes from one of the most popular poems in the world, The Dash, by Linda Ellis. It means to be mindful that we're only on this earth a little while. It means to spend each day with passion and purpose and to inspire others by living a life of joy, compassion, and kindness. Let me ask you something. Is that your life right now? If it's not, it's time to change it. So here's the poem, The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstones from the beginning to the end. So I just thought it was very interesting. Here I'm standing there, and I love this. I've, I've taken people that have visited me here, here from Washington State all the way up to see that church because I was so impressed with it. The name of the church, it's called the Church of the Holy Spirit. It's on a big stone in the front. And it's a Quaker church. So I just, to me, that was so cool. So I had taken people to see this. So as this young lady is reading this, I'm just thinking, wow. So let me go on with the poem. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following day with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them now what that little line is worth. For it, for it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that still can be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and to love the people in our lives like we never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that the special dash might only last a little while. 
So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? So, live your dash. Think about it. Be slow to anger. Anger can become like a cancer and eat away at your ability to be joyful and kind. Life is too short. Choose forgiveness. And I asked about this gentleman. I said, so he never held, he said, no, never held anything against anybody. He always forgave people. As William Ward once said, forgiveness is the key that unlocks the handcuffs of hate. Wow. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the handcuffs of hate. And you know, well, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later. Say another thing you can do to help uh, people remember your dash. How about just say thank you? Just say thank you. Those two little words hold incredible power. Think about how you feel when someone thanks you. You feel validated and appreciated. When you do the same for other people, you pass along that positive emotion. It may be just what they needed at that moment. How about try loving people instead of hating them? Our dash moves with lightning speed. It seems like only yesterday the kids were just toddlers learning to walk, and now they've got children of their own. As they say, the days are long, but the years are short. Love people. Days are long, but the, you notice that? It seems like the day is long. But boy, I look back 17 years ago. I did their wedding. Their little boy, that they, he had a six-year-old son from a previous marriage or something. One of them had a previous son. And now he's a Marine. He's been in the Marines three years, maybe four. And now they have another son. And you know, they're just going on with life and they're setting the example. So never miss the opportunity to show love and to say, I love you. I've shared this story before, but I've got to share it again. Many years ago, back in oh, 1984, my older brother, who was a year and a half older than me, he was dying at the age of 25, 24, 25 years old. And I remember the last few words I got to say to him is that I love you. I don't know if he heard me. I hope he did. But he'd already died three times, and they had resuscitated him with the, um, you know, with the, with the shockers. He'd had cancer, and he was dying, and we drove all night just so we could see him before he died. And I remember calling my brother, who was at a job interview in, um, in Kentucky somewhere. I called him up. Didn't think I'd get a hold of him, but I said, well, I'm going to try. I called up, and, and I asked the, per the person answered the phone. I said, I know my brother's supposed to be on an airplane by now, but is there any chance... You know, Jim Ford is there, and he said, she goes, well, he's sitting right next to me. So I got on the phone, and I told him, I said, hey, I said, there's no reason for you to stop in Seattle on your way home, because he'll, be, he'll have passed by the time you got here. And he just passed 10 minutes after, after I hung up the phone. And my brother said, but I got to get there. I said, but it's too late. He said, I never got to say, I love you. Wow. So are your final words to the people that you really love is I love you? Are they real or are they just fake? Are they real or are they fake? Treat others with respect. You have an opportunity every day to spend your dash through simple acts of kindness and respect. This quote of George Washington Carver says it best. How far you go in your life depends on you being tender with the young compassionate with the age, sympathetic with the striving and tolerant of the weak and strong. Because someday in your life, you will have been all of these. Someday, you'll be all of those. How about wear a smile? Our dash may be short, but it can be wide. Often a simple smile will break through tensions and stress. A smile will not only affect those around you, but it will change your attitude and your outlook on life. How about remember how life is so short? Make every moment matter. It's been said that we don't remember days, we remember moments. Being present and in the moment provides some of life's greatest joys. A crackling fire or a coal, on a cold winter night, reading a love note from your spouse, watching a beautiful sunset, or having coffee with a friend. It's moments like these that make life worth living. You know what? Don't forget to make those moments. Think about your life. 
What are some moments you cherish and hold most dear? Who are the people in your life that you need to say thank you to? Is there someone in your life who used, you used, <laughs> who could use some love and attention? How about a smile or a hug? Examine your heart and think about what is true and real. Now is the time to rearrange the things that need to be changed. Live your dash well. Living that dash while here on earth can plant those seeds in others' lives that could lead them to eternity with Christ. Did you get that? It could make all the difference. Sharing your testimony of being alcohol-free. Sharing your testimony of God healing you. Sharing your testimony of how God did this or God did that. You don't know how you will affect other people. But that smile, that testimony could change a person's life. In 1 John 5, 13, it says in the Amplified, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which represents all that Jesus Christ is and does, so that you will know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have eternal life. This is the remarkable decree of confidence which we as believers are entitled to and have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. Verse 15, and if we know for a fact, as indeed we do, that he hears and he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with, with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted to us a request which have, we have asked from him. So why is that? Because we're born again. We know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He's in our heart. And so you should have that confidence. And that should change how you act while you're still here on earth. A great pastor I've, I've listened to probably about almost all of my, probably about 35, 38 years, something like that. Many of you have um, heard the song Majesty, Worship His Majesty. He wrote that song. His name is Jack Hayford. Wonderful pastor. He's still, he's still doing great. His wife passed away a few years ago. I don't remember when, but he just kept on with the ministry. He's still preaching. He said this, when God created the first living thing, he gave it the ability to grow and multiply. How? Through the principle of sowing and reaping. Life begins by this principle, and since birth, your life has operated on that same principle. Harvest springs from the good or bad seed you have sown, whether or not you are consciously aware of your seed planting. The principle continues today to overcome life's problems, reach your potential in life, see your life become fruitful, multiplied, and replenished. That is, in health, finances, spiritual renewal, and family, your entire being determined, now get this, determined to follow God's law of seed time and harvest. Now here's a gentleman that is up in his, he's very up there in age. But he's telling you and I, up until he goes home to be with the Lord, he is going to continue to plant seeds and harvest seeds. The scriptures say you don't know what tomorrow will bring. It's so true, isn't it? You don't know what, you don't know what you're going to have. You say, well, I know what I'll have for breakfast. Maybe you won't. Maybe your kids ate that. You've got to have something else. I don't know. Proverbs 27, 1 in the Passion says, Never brag about the plans you have for tomorrow, for you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring to you. James 4, 14 says, Yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen in your life tomorrow. What is the cure in your life? This is James 4, 14. You are merely a vapor like a puff of smoke or a wisp of steam from a cooking pot that is visible for a little while and then vanishes into the air. So, it is an unchangeable fact that we could die today. Likewise, we live that the reality that Jesus could return at any moment. We say that we believe these truths, but do you really believe it? Do you believe that Jesus could come back at this moment? Boom, at the, you know, the sudden clap, a trumpet sound, and he's, he's back. If we truly believe that today could be our last, then we may do something a little different. If we knew the exact date of our passing we would probably have an entirely different priorities, wouldn't we? There's no reason for us to wait until the end to make things right. I hope that you don't put things off until you get some trouble, uh, some troubling tests, results, before you get things in order. We should live in a way that if we knew for a fact that we would die tomorrow, 
we wouldn't have to change a single thing. This is possible, and this is exactly how each and every child of God should live. So if today was your last day, what would you say and what would you do? It's a lot to think about. I'm going to finish this up probably Tuesday night. But I really believe I've already hit on a lot. That you have to, you know, if you live in between the dash, but one day you're going to have that last date on that. No matter what, it's going to be there. So get ready. Be prepared that Christ could come at any moment. Literally any moment. And you know what? We have a little box up here. And if, if the rapture happens and somebody's going through our stuff, they'll find it and they'll say how to get saved. There's actually a CD and everything up here. So I guarantee, you know, God wants to use you now. I don't care who you are. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, you need to talk to people about eternity. Not just about today, but also about eternity. Because that is your final harvest. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you that the word is always telling us that we need to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. And not, just, not because, oh, we're going to be punished. Yes, we will be judged for what we have done for Christ while we've known Christ. But the blood of Christ will cover our sins. But we should do it because we love him and we want to, to please him. So, Father, I, I thank you and I praise you that how you still you teach me even in a burial service or at a cemetery, or at an old church, how you teach me when I'm setting down or when I'm rising up, how you should teach all of us, and I know you want to. So let us have ears to hear and eyes to see, a heart open and prepared for what you have for us. I thank you and I praise you. Bless everybody that hears this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week in the Lord. Get excited. You know, this virus thing ain't going to last forever. Sooner or later, somebody's going to decide it's not the big deal that they thought it was or that God is just going to say, that's it. And you're going to feel like running through the field. You're going to be all excited. As I'm talking to you now, there's a deer running through our field over there. Somebody's scared of deer. So I'm thinking, you know what? We're going to feel that freedom once more, once again. God bless and have a great one.